Hey, Mark here from PondalchiSolutions.com. Today I want to talk very, very briefly, or as briefly as I can, about dealing with algae in a large pond, large body of water. This would be a setting where you don't have a filter, you don't have a UV light, you don't have circulation in the pond of, uh, you know, piping where a pump drives water through a pipe and through a waterfall and things like that. Typically, uh, small ponds would use mechanical types of devices like filters, biofilters to help manage things, but large pond owners don't have that luxury. It's really not practical. So, you know, it, it revolves around the most common question I get day after day, as you might expect. I have an algae problem. What do I do about it? How do I deal with this, this issue? And um, for any pond that is, you know, 100,000 gallons, 250,000 gallons on up, large ponds uh, like that typically aren't going to have filters. And so you're going to have to deal with them in a very natural, uh, you know, more of a natural way. So the funny thing about this that I think throws people a little bit, and my, my answers are always the same. It never changes because it's very foundational. But I will, the very first question I'll ask you in a reply is, do you have aeration in the pond? Typically, that might look like a fountain. It might be a subsurface diffused aerator sitting on the bottom. And the reason that I ask that question is, first of all, it's sort of preliminary in that a lot of any necessary follow-up type treatment applications, whether they be chemical or natural biological type, they're, they're benefited greatly by aeration, but it goes much deeper than that. It's amazing how often an individual will put an aerator in a pond with a problem and the problem will remedy itself. In other words, it just resolves. Um, you see it over and over again. It's not 100% and it's not, you know, I don't, I don't have a percentage. It's not all the time, but it's often. And the reason for that is when you increase oxygen and in circulation in a pond, particularly low in the pond, certain things start to happen. You get a an interesting sequestration of phosphorus, which that's one of the nutrients that's a big driver of algae problems. And you'll, you'll get a improved sequestration of this phosphorus into the substrate of the pond bottom, um, which takes it right out of the, the mix. It's not available for algae to use for fuel anymore. You also see, I believe, this is my opinion, you see a stimulation and an improvement in the vitality of any naturally occurring microbes that may exist in a pond setting. They are in a pond anyway. They get in there, that's part of nature's way to clean and balance them, but they do require good oxygen levels to be optimized. And when they start to ramp up and do their business, they, in a sense, start to outcompete the algae for the nutrients, and they can really drive the nutrient level down. You do that, it's all about nutrients, by the way, but you do that, and the algae will have to recede. It cannot maintain its, its, its current state if the nutrients and the fuel go down. And so, particularly if somebody's looking to try to deal with an algae problem organically, non-chemically, aeration is a huge tool, and that's why I ask about it first. The second thing is, if you have aeration, um, we would then look at, again, going after those nutrients a little bit more and the way we would do that let, let's say you have aeration going and it's not really improving anything or maybe it hasn't changed dramatically I have to assume the nutrients are still high and in that way I would make an assumption that possibly the the microbial base the natural microbial base that could help us in this effort in the pond may be low it may have been affected if you use copper algicides historically it could be affected that could knock down good microbes as well as the bad bugs so i would probably come in behind the aeration with some supplemental microbial uh, our Biosphere Pro is commonly used. It's easy to dose and easy to apply, and so that's what I think most of our folks use. But there's, you know, in the marketplace, there's a ton of different things that you could try. And uh, we will try to one-two punch it with the aeration and the microbes. That can work a lot of the time, and it helps a lot of issues. Um, in certain settings, we may, and this is for very big waters often, I might use ultrasound because where I start to find additives uh, to be cost prohibitive I'm looking for other tools aeration ultrasound stuff like that where 
and I think this applies to any large pond owner, you, you have to watch the cost of additives. And that's, again, I'll go back to why we use aeration. We get more bang for the buck out of anything we put in later if we have air going. It, it actually, I think, saves money uh, for people after that initial investment. But I try my best to stay away from additives or keep them as limited as possible, whether they're chemical or biological. The cost of additives month after month, year after year, adds up. And, uh, and on large waters, it's extremely uh, expensive to treat. I mean, we had a customer out east who was spending $50,000 a year to treat their lake with a, a chemical algaecide. Great for the people selling the algaecide, not so great for the pond owner. And so ultrasound was a very viable option for them to consider uh, when you think about the initial investment and then the very low cost to operate versus these treatments. Nothing I'm saying here is a silver bullet. I don't want to give that impression. And if anybody ever tells you that there's a silver bullet for it out there, they're lying or they're just not being as honest as they should be. There is no silver bullet to this stuff. But there are strategic ways that you can work against algae, improve upon dramatically, and quite often clear it up very nicely. For us, at the end of the line, we do look at chemicals. Um, we use a low-dose copper algaecide that has great suspension. I try to use it in a way that uh, stops the algae from forming, meaning I don't want to have to have a bloom, treat it, kill it, have a bloom, treat it, kill it. I want to knock the thing down and I want to keep it down from, from blooming again because I'm trying to stop or slow the filling in of the pond of organic material. Um, but again, I, we don't use algaecides that much. It's not something we have to do very often, but certain settings do call for it. And, uh, uh, you know, in a simple way, that's our protocol. That's how I would deal with an algae problem in a large pond. If you have specific questions uh, about your pond, about dealing with a particular issue, you can reach out to us at pondalgesolutions.com. We can get into more specifics of what aerator will work best for your setting, size, and depth. Um, would biologicals make sense? You know, would ultrasound make sense? Uh, what, what would help? Happy to help in greater detail there, but for this uh, video, I just wanted to run over the basics and tell you how I would deal with almost every inquiry we get, uh, large pond owners who say, what can I do to help with my algae problem? That's it in a nutshell. So hope you have a great day wherever you are. Get in touch if you need assistance, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Take care.